further ado, let's get going. And you've got a panel run to pick, and I'll put this other one here for people who want to trade off to the hot mic screen. Good. Hi, everyone. I'll keep this very short. I'm Francisco. I basically work on using machine learning to speed up retrievals. Uh, the actual factor by which the, speed, the retrievals are speed up uh, is not exactly 10, so you know, don't take that literally. Um, but basically, if you're interested in doing retrievals and you're just becoming desperate at uh, how slow they are, or if you want to include more physics in your retrievals, uh, you should come talk to me. Thank you. Oh, does this work? Okay. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Bruno Gust from EPFL Lausanne and the University of Chicago, and I'm here today to talk about my recent paper about WAS77AB, which, as it turns out, has been made into a group project, so spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> so basically what our study reveals is uh, H2O and CO in the spectrum, and strikingly no CO2, um, and actually we have a really good agreement with ground-based high-resolution spectroscopy results that were led by Mike Lyons' team. Um, Furthermore, thermal emission spectroscopy allows us to study the complex thermal chem chemical structure of the atmosphere. And at the end, we have a little bit of comparative planetology. So if you're interested, come talk to me. Thanks. Okay, so hello everybody. Now we're going from WAS77 to WAS76. And basically, uh, I'm Tomás. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Astrophysics and Space Science in Portugal. And I study exoplanet atmospheres. And in this poster, I'm going to talk to you about the detection of pyrium that we did very recently. And basically, the idea is that I do a transmission spectroscopy, which basically means that we study the light as it's filtered through the atmosphere of the planet as it transits across the stellar disk. And we look into it using high resolution spectroscopy. This is with Expresso, which is at a very large telescope in, in Chile. And as the name suggests, it's a very large telescope, so it allows us to detect very, very faint uh, absorption features from these planets. We study was 76 b and was one b that are true ultra Jupiter, so very large planets with very large atmospheres, which is great for transmission. And we are able to detect all of these species in the atmosphere of these planets. And in the poster, we go over how we can able to detect these species, like the techniques that we use. And we can see, for example, even the effects of the planet crossing stellar disk and even resolve the planetary absorption across, the, across time and see basically perfectly matching the orbital velocity. And the most interesting one is that we are able to detect barium, which is a which was the heaviest element at the time detected in exoplanet atmospheres, which kind of raises the question, what is such an heavy element doing so high in the atmospheres? So yeah, if you have any questions, please come talk to me after and I'd love to chat with you about the, the poster. Hi everyone, my name is Crystalline, and I'm doing something a little bit different here. I study brown dwarfs in particular. I'm trying to forward model the atmosphere of 0415 uh, using Spitzer Space Telescope and the Ikari Space Telescope, which is a Japanese space telescope. And I use the Sonora model family um, to forward model 0415. And these models all have different features that I can go about in greater detail if you come visit me at my poster. And what I do specifically is I break up all of the uh, spectra of 0415 15 based on which telescope was observing. So ground-based observations, Akari observations, Spitzer, and then all of it put together to make one whole um, spectrum that you can see right here. I would love to talk more to, with you about this, but so far we see with the full spectrum that the Choya models are best fit for 0415's uh, spectrum. So come find me later. Hi everyone. My name is Katie Bennett. I am a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University, and I am one of those people looking for atmospheres on rocky M dwarf planets. So just like Heather was talking about today, you know, obviously this is like looking to see whether a rocky planet has an atmosphere is the first order test of its habitability. Uh, and because of that, we really want to understand whether we can predict which planets are likely to have atmospheres and which ones aren't. So there's this idea of the cosmic shoreline, this dividing line between planets with and without atmospheres. And we think it's due to some kind of combination of stellar insulation, you know, how hot does the planet get versus how big is it? How high is it? Is is its escape velocity. So the hotter the planet and the smaller it is, the lower its escape velocity, the less likely we think it is to hold on to its atmosphere. So I've been uh, able to join a cycle one program led by Kevin Stevenson and Jake Lustigager looking at five rocky m dwarf planets to see on what side of the cosmic shoreline we think these planets fall. So my poster is 
is uh, showing just one of these planets, GJ1132b. So if you want to know whether we think it has an atmosphere or not, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Ananya Bhattacharya from University of Michigan. So I am representing the solar system and some Juno results over here. So uh, this is the, the recently accepted paper from our group uh, in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. So we uh, do remote sensing of Jupiter's deep atmosphere. And this, this frequency in particular is only exclusively accessible from space-based observations from Juno. We can't get it from ground-based observations. And what we find that there is uh, an additional source of opacity in Jupiter's deep atmosphere cannot be explained by water abundances. And we can constrain the alkali metal abundance from this. And what you see over here is that uh, they are severely subsolar. And like uh, some people over here talked about enrichment in giant planets. So, you know, this poses a big question, especially because if there are less alkali metals, there could be a possibility of a radiative layer, which might inhibit convection and mixing processes. So yeah, I'll be uh, really eager to discuss more about it. I am interning at JPL. So here for this month and uh, looking forward to talk to you all. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Eric, jointly based at the University of Edinburgh and Kyle Leuven. Uh, and I'm, as we heard this morning from Heather and Julie already, uh, planets are 3D. Uh, so what I'm using is a 3D coupled climate chemistry model to, is anything? Um, is a 3D coupled climate chemistry model uh, to model the atmospheric chemistry on rocky exoplanets around M dwarfs, and specifically the ones in synchronous orbits. So you can see day side, night side temperature differences with especially cold uh, gyres on the night side. And then on the right, you can see that ozone, this is the vertically integrated uh, ozone column, and you can see that ozone builds up inside uh, these gyres, which is interesting because um, Ozone depends on photochemistry, and you can see from the star on the plot there that photochemistry is limited to the day side uh, of the planet. And therefore, some kind of connection has to exist between this ozone production region here and the buildup in the gyres. And what we find is a uh, stratospheric day side to night side circulation is driving uh, this 3D ozone distribution. And if you want to learn more about it, uh, come visit my poster. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Xue Qing Chen from University of Edinburgh also. Um, and uh, my poster is about mapping the weather patterns on Borndorf. So I'm just here to convince you that Borndorfs are interesting because they have clouds and the clouds are similar to those on the giant exoplanets. So what I do is I use a technique called Doppler imaging to map out these clouds uh, by tracing the change of line shapes um, of individual lines as patterns rotate across the Brondorf. So we have high resolution time resolved uh, spectroscopy of uh, Lumen 16b, which is the nearest and brightest Brondorf we can find for this task. And uh, here are the maps we have. Um, so what are these dark patterns? Uh, what do they mean? Please come to my poster and know more about clouds. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Connor. I'm from the University of Cambridge in the UK, working with Nikki Medusadan. Um, my main research is on high resolution transmission spectroscopy. Um, so the high resolution of these ground-based uh, spectrographs offers a number of advantages, but the main problem is removing the Earth's um, atmospheric contribution or telluric um, contamination. So in the near infrared, where I'm mainly looking at, uh, the most common way of doing this detrending is with PCA um, or principal component analysis. But the question remains how many principal components to remove. Um, so we recently submitted a paper or published a paper um, looking into different ways of making a selection uh, robustly. And the main result was that if you over-optimize this detrending, you can lead to uh, bias detection significances. So if you're interested in that, uh, please talk to me later. Hi there. If you are interested in atmospheric hazes, then my poster is for you. And if you hate atmospheric hazes, then my poster is also for you. 
Um, so what we did is we built a 3D haze model that includes haze transfer and radiative transfer into an existing intermediate complexity GCM. And then we did uh, 64 simulations. So our model is fast enough to do one year of model time in eight minutes when fully parallelized. And we simulated two types of planets and 32 rotation rates. And we looked at how the 3D haze distribution came out for across this parameter space. And we were looking at two particular questions. One was, are certain types of planets less hazy than others, like systematically? Can we guess based on the rotation rate whether some planets are less hazy? And the other was, uh, are there any um, systematic features of the structure, like terminate asymmetry, that could help us interpret observations? And if you want to know the answer to those questions, come visit my poster, Maureen Cohen, at University of Edinburgh in the poster hall. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, what I've been working on is, uh, so recently a companion has been detected to HIP 21152. It's a 26 Jupiter mass companion, originally detected through astrometry. And so I've done some high resolution spectra follow-up on the object. Uh, I guess uh, my poster is explaining a little more about that. Uh, so, this object, we think there's trace methane in the atmosphere and through these high resolution spectra observations we've done, we should be able to detect methane. I'm not there yet. What I'm here to present on is my detection of the object. We have a detection of the object through forward modeling and uh, observation using KPIC. KPIC is a ground-based high resolution spectroscopy instrument that works with NERSPEC at Keck. And if you're interested in this discovery or want to know more about KPIC observations, uh, come find me on my poster or stop me anywhere. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jack. I'm a PhD student from London. And so my research is based on atmospheric retrievals, but looking specifically at the statistics and sampling procedures behind it all. So what I'm looking into is likelihood free inference. So removing the assumption of the likelihood function from our sampling procedures, which is already done quite a lot in cosmology, but we don't seem to do it much with exoplanet studies. So we just want to see what sort of effects we can see in the posterior distributions over on the right in the retrievals if we introduce non-Gaussian effects artificially into spectra. Um, and the reason we want to do this at the moment is mostly because of James Webb and the new, the higher quality data we're now getting. But there are lots of questions that we want to look into and yeah, lots of different effects we might be able to see in the posteriors. So we're just seeing what sort of sensitivity these methods have. Um, thank you. Hi there, I'm Sam. Uh, and I wanted to share some of the first results from the ESO subject survey which is a program where we aim to disentangle the formation pathways of uh, super Jupiters and isolated brown dwarfs using isotope ratios. And this survey was carried out with the Cryos Plus uh, high resolution spectrograph. And all of these objects in the column magnitude diagram were observed. And one of those is the isolated brown dwarf Danish J0255. Um, and we uh, did an analysis of its, uh, a retrieval analysis of its spectrum. And that's resulted in this excellent fit. And what we find is that a chemical equilibrium retrieval is heavily disfavored over a free chemistry approach. And this is because the methane abundance would generally be too high in equilibrium. And so the uh, temperature profile and the photosphere are adjusted in order to suppress these methane absorption lines. Furthermore, we find evidence for the presence of ammonia and we find some tentative evidence for 13CO. And uh, the carbon isotope ratio that we constrain with this 13CO uh, actually shows a depletion of 13C compared to the local ISM. And that is in line with uh, previous analysis of a uh, isolated brown dwarf. So if you want to learn more about this, come and visit my poster or uh, ask me a question. There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Ashley Elliott. I'm a PhD student at LSU working with Dr. Tabitha Boyajan, who is the PI for the LUSTER mission. Um, LUSTER stands for the Lunar Based Survey for Time Domain Exoplanet Research, and our core team is listed over here along with some early career researchers. So why do we care about putting a telescope on the moon? Well, first, uh, putting a telescope on the moon, uh, we 
don't have the Earth's atmosphere, so UV observations are more easily obtained. Second, uh, the moon allows for two weeks of, uh, of un un uninterrupted observations. And lastly, the lunar surface does provide a stable platform for observatory. Scientifically, uh, placing a tidal scope on the moon allows for improved planetary ephemeris and new transmission spectroscopy in the UV range will be added to additional um, trans uh, spectroscopy and other wavelengths. The spectra will be used to study clouds and hazes seen on exoplanets. And let me go back to this other slide. Example, uh, spectra of WASP-19b in purple can be seen here, and we have the web data in red, the Kepler test in green, and Lester will aim to fill the gap in the UV um, where limited data exists through Hubble of exoplanet atmospheres. And if you're interested in more, come see me at my poster. Hi, my name is Sierra Foote, and I am a graduate student at the University of Arizona Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Our project aims to solve the mesosphere mystery by modeling the middle atmospheres of hot Jupiter and beyond. So why is the mesosphere, well, mysterious? The issue lies in current models. Current climate models often only simulate the deep atmosphere. And if they do go to mesosphere-like pressures, they don't incorporate crucial NLTE physics. We can see here at the left, this figure developed by Showman et al. and Koskinen et al., a pressure temperature profile for our hot Jupiter of interest, HD 209458b. And I've illustrated here where this gap in model physics occurs, which is right in the middle of the middle atmosphere. So if current models aren't enough to simulate this area, then why do we care about this now? Well, the issue, um, the, the answer to this question um, lies in the process of atmospheric heating and atmospheric escape. So the lower boundary conditions for atmospheric escape are set by the mesosphere, which makes it a key player in explaining the potential abundance of subneptunes and leads us to the question of how can we improve upon an NLTE climate model and draw conclusions about potentially habitable worlds. I invite you to explore these topics with me by visiting my poster. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Emmeline Fromont. I'm a rising second year graduate student at the University of Maryland. And I wanna really briefly talk to you about a really cool system of multiple rocky planets around an M dwarf, L9859. Um, so the inner three planets, B, C, and D are very close into their star, meaning they're very highly irradiated. Um, and uh, the way they developed, we believe that they are likely to have had uh, a significant quantity of volatiles, including water by the time uh, that they finished evolving. Uh, so this combination means that they are very prone to atmospheric escape. So that's what I'm interested in studying is the atmospheric escape of these three rocky planets and uh, what that might mean in the context of JWST observations of the system. Um, so we ran a model called vPlanet uh, to basically put some water on the planets and then evolve them over a long period of time to see what would happen. We mainly tracked water and oxygen quantities on the planets. And so what we find uh, in the blue plots, you can see, we find that the planets are continuously losing significant quantities of water over time, but they're also gaining a lot of oxygen, uh, which, and it's a significant enough amount that we think it might be observable by JWST, which is very exciting. Um, so if you want to see uh, different versions of this plot based on how much water we start them out with, uh, please come talk to me, poster 32. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Germain Garot. I'm a PhD student at the University of Leuven in Belgium, and I work on a new instrument for exoplanet imaging that is called Asgard NOT. NOT stands for Nulling Observations of Dust and Exoplanets. And I, I made a very small slide to explain very quickly how the instrument is working and why it is very interesting. So we're planning to install this instrument at the Very Large Telescope Interferometer at the end of 2025. 2025, so, sorry. And then we're planning to observe young planetary systems with four telescopes of the VLTI and then inject the light of each of these telescopes in the photonic chip that you see here in yellow. This chip that is the size of my finger is able using interferometry to separate the light of the star and the light of exoplanets. So then using this chip, we can do direct imaging of exoplanets near the snow line, which is very difficult with the current instruments. And my work is more on the optics, optical design that are upstream of the chip, but my poster is also about the science that we're expecting to do with this uh, instrument. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, my name is Dino Su. I'm a postdoc at Northwestern University. Uh, today I'm talk I'll be talking about uh, rotational balances of the uh, of Gaia Hippolytus detected uh, Brondo companion, that's HD 3632AB uh, with a KPIC. So thanks really for your explanation. This is a fi single mole fiber fed version of CAC near spec plus AO system on CAC. Um, it provides high resolution spectra. And then we follow up with that um, a few years ago. And then this is the uh, four model spectrum. So black is um, uh, the data and then the four model with the on axis uh, spectral and the uh, uh, BD settle models for companion. We uh, detected uh, its rotation. And this is actually a fast rotator, about 53 km per second. This is a rather fast rotator, but it's a well within uh, this is, uh, general brown uh, rotation dome graphics. And also, we can also do the retrievals. Uh, thanks, uh, Paul Muller, for uh, Petty Retrans package. So, this is a cross correlation detection of a CO plus uh, water combined. And we also constrain uh, the CO and water individually and pl uh, place upper limit on the method because we didn't really detect it. Uh, feel free to come stop my, my poster or ask me any questions. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Lori Hughesby, and I'm a rising second year at the University of Arizona Lunar Planetary Lab. And so I know a lot of you guys have been talking about exoplanets, but what about their host stars? So I present to you Pegasus, the Phoenix UV grid and stellar UV spectra grid that's going to be um, in development as we speak. So it uses um, your inputs as well as Galax FUV and NUV data and extrapolates the EUV from that not only saving high uh, high performance computing time um, compared to individual stars, but also achieves the goal of making the EUV accessible to the scientific community. So on top of this, this work is comprised of 1,225 um, high resolution models that will cover both M and K host stars, um, ones that we are looking at um, specifically with JWST. And so at my poster, you can find what happens to Lyman alpha as spectral type changes, what happens when you change the physical parameters of the chromosphere, and what other applications does this grid have? So feel free to come visit me at any time or see me at my poster. Thank you. Hello, Jay Gugui from University of Maryland. Um, so, so far, James Webb has not discovered, has not found a strong evidence for a thick atmosphere on rocket planets, neither in transmission or emission. In my poster, I have a mini poster in the poster talking about the secondary eclipse observation of Trappist 1b, showing that it does not have an atmosphere. But we will detect atmospheres at some point. And the natural question to ask is Is there a trend in which planets do or do not host atmospheres? Does the solar system cosmic shoreline persist to M stars, or does it need to be modified in some ways? For instance, if your star is fully convective, it has a longer active period. So could that prohibit the retention of atmospheres? So to, and then we want to answer how many targets do you need to identify those, which targets and what observing modes. And to do that, we combine formation evolution models, RC models, observation and retrieval models to do a population level injection recovery simulation to see if a injected cosmic shoreline can be recovered. And um, if that sounds slow, that's because it is, but it is doable. Um, and here I'm showing a random draw from an informed toy model showing that uh, you could distinguish between uh, different hypotheses. And in the poster, I have um, done the Monte Carlo for the toy model and show the um, histograms of the big values. Um, to be a little bit obnoxious, um, I'll be applying for postdoc positions the coming cycle. Um, please give me a job. Um, these are the things I do. Um, thank you very much. Hi, uh, name is Vincent Kaufman. I work with the Planetary Spectrum Generator Team at NASA Goddard on the East Coast. Um, and some work I'm presenting here concerns 3D simulations. And what we've been trying to do is generate hyper-realistic simulations of Earth as an exoplanet. Um, I'm pretty happy with the results we've gotten here. So we've, we've, we've been doing some efforts to try and model clouds correctly, service coverage. Um, last week, I was working on snow and ice coverage, which is quite a challenge. Um, and what we what what plant what the planetary spectrum generator allows to do is you can um, upload a GCM file into the PS, into PSG, uh, specify which calculations you want to do. You get here all the specifics, um, and then for every point on this grid, uh, it'll do a full radiative transfer calculation. Um, and then what I've been working on is trying to get from these from these three D spectra to actual simulations like this. Um, 
thing what we want to want to try and reveal is how much of the sort of the, the spatial home, uh, heterogeneities of the planet are visible using future future telescopes. Um, the future telescopes part, PSG has a bunch of simulations um, and simulated telescopes in embedded already. So that's the that will be the next step. Um, but first, we were, we were working on ingesting Earth as an exoplanet. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about the, the 3D simulations because it's it's been a fun journey co going from upside down planets and inverted colors and all that stuff to uh, to where we've gotten now. So thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Latouf. I am a graduate research fellow at George Mason and NASA Goddard. If this looks familiar to you, it's probably because you saw it on Twitter. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the Barbie project. So um, detecting water stands as the first step in the search for habitability generally, uh, but we don't know too much about how water varies through Earth's time. And so by varying it, we can kind of study how water could vary as a function of time on Earth and also how detectability changes as a function of varying these um, molecular abundances. Uh, the conclusions that we found is that water vapor can be detected down to about 0.74 microns uh, with moderate SNR data. Uh, at the upper end of Earth's presumed historical values, or uh, all the way up to 0.9 microns uh, with low SNR data at modern Earth values. So if we can understand the SNR requirements for detecting molecules of interest um, and vary those abundances through time, we can properly prioritize spectral band passes for optimal detectability if we're assuming a coronagraph for, for instance, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, hint, hint, uh, and design better observing procedure. Um, if you are interested in how I got from point A to point B, which of course you are, it's fascinating, please come check me out at my poster. It is the bright pink one. Thank you so much. All right, hi everyone. My name is Michaela Leung. I'm a PhD student at the University of California, Riverside. Um, I'll be talking to you today about my work um, on a new category of biosignatures, specifically um, those that are produced by the biomethylation process, um, which generates a, a wide variety of gases. Um, and we, in our work, we've shown that they build up, um, particularly around M dwarf stars to uh, relatively high abundances um, in the atmosphere uh, of planets orbiting M dwarfs in particular. Um, and we also found a really interesting co-additive spectral effect in the mid-infrared when there are more, multiple methylated gases present. You can get a much uh, larger combined feature that we're hoping um, will be potentially detectable with future uh, mid-infrared capable uh, exoplanet observatories. Um, this QR code here is for our paper, um, and I do have uh, additional work that's not in the paper. Um, so if you want to hear more about kind of the future directions of this project um, and a little bit more um, about the background, my poster is poster number 40. It is right next to Natasha's bright pink poster. So you can come find us there. Hello, I'm Colette Levins, a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And if this looks like it's just my poster, that's because it is. So look forward to this. Um, I'm just gonna go through the key points real quick. So my work is on constraining the abundances of CO and water in the atmosphere of ultra hot Jupiter WASP-121b with high resolution retrievals and transmission spectra. Um, hot Jupiters have this unique link to planet formations and habitability due to their extreme temperatures. And WASP-121b in particular has strong iron lines and promising emission spectroscopy results. So with our high resolution transmission spectroscopy, we decided to try to constrain the CO and water abundances. Super quick, um, through high resolution retrieval, excuse me, high resolution retrieval process, we start with our data to make a forward model, which we calculate a model spectrum out of. We use a Bayesian estimator with the parameters that we want to characterize um, and a couple more calculations, just a couple, um, and pi multiness, and we get a posterior. Right in the center is the big result. Um, it's quite small, but that's okay. The, the of interest um, are the KP and VSIS values. Um, orbital and systemic velocity are ever so slightly off from what we might expect. And so we're kind of assuming that this is probably due to 3D effects that we're missing in our one dimensional retrieval. And super fascinatingly, we have a clear detection and constrained abundance for CO 
Um, and that value is log C of minus 4.1 and two peaks for water, interestingly enough, um, at uh, minus 4.6 and minus 6.2. So in the future with this, what we want to do is investigate and incorporate the 3D effects that I mentioned we might be missing. Um, benchmark those 3D effects and parameterize the 3D effects and use in our 1D retrievals to make them better. Hi, I'm the last person, but the presentation is not least. Yeah, so what I'm doing is about the exoloading effect on the chronograph. And the reason why I have to focus on this is because previously people usually uh, ignore the dust inside the inner working angle of chronograph. But if we consider the dust inside the inner working angle, we will find that we previously underestimate the axolotl effect. And another thing is previously people usually use the solar light system, which is, I would say is like a toy, toy system. So I suggest that we should use a realistic system. And I could, right now I'm, I'm able to make a, a more re realistic disk from the SED data. So we can feed the SED data and we can create a disk. And then we can combine it with a different kind of chronograph. And yeah, so here is a small project. You can scan it and you can know how, how I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah, and this is my Google Scholar. And yeah, this is my ORCID. There are some contact. Yeah, my email address you can find from here. Yeah, uh, so if you want to know the detail, just come to my poster. <laughs>